Well, hello, America. I'm outside tonight. I want to show you. This is the uh, News Corp building. This is uh, where Fox is. That's 6th Avenue. Behind us is uh, Times Square at the end of the block. And this little corner, as you see, is not even really attached to the building. It's kind of hanging out of the cell. When we first started, we were up on the, uh, what was it, the 12th floor? 12th floor. Uh, and then uh, we wanted a space that we could change a little bit. And so they put us in this studio here. And at, for a while, we had these windows open. For a myriad of reasons, we closed them. Um, and they haven't been open, I think, since we have been in this studio. By the end of the hour, they'll be opened up again as we are starting to take the set apart. And this is the last episode of the Glenn Beck program. And we have, we've really done some amazing things together. You, wherever you are, and all of us here. And it has been an amazing journey. Before we go forward, we want to spend just a couple of minutes going back and showing you where we've been in the last two and a half years. Thank you. The new Glenn Beck program on Fox News begins January 19th. Glenn Beck starts Monday, 5 Eastern. It's only the third time that I've actually done live TV, so buckle up, because it could get very, very bumpy. This is a very, very, oh, here I am. Hello, America. Out of control government that would regulate everything in their life and tell them exactly our bricks just fell down. La, 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 la. from the Western Front. This is the dumbest damn show on air. <laughs> Somebody's having a birthday tomorrow. I have so much manufactured anger in me. Anita, call me. hope and charity it's time to introduce you to the plan crime incorporated that is what our government is turning into this is a four-step program that I've asked you to do please start here take the 40 day count pledge to yourself that you will restore honor in your own life Enlightenment, education, empowerment, entrepreneurship. I stand tonight with Israel. Circus. America is an idea. It's an idea that man can rule himself. The truth is, they don't surround us. We surround them. This is our country. We must mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Once we start to live by those words again, we'll be able to win this battle for our country's soul. remember the things that you taught me. You've taught me to, to look around my surroundings, open my eyes, and question things that I thought were wrong. You've enlightened me in such a deep way. Thank you for teaching me that I'm not the only conservative in the world, and it's all right to stand up for what I believe in. Actually, your show inspired me to write a conservative opinion column. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you for speaking the truth every day. Please, please, don't stop. If I had my choice, I would like to be remembered for a few things. 
question with boldness. Hold to the truth. Speak without fear. We'll question with boldness. We'll hold to the truth. We'll speak without fear. Thank you, Glenn. It was on this spot, it was on this spot right here that uh, we started the 912 project. Promises made, promises kept. This is, this is backstage um, at the show. All you can see all, all of the props. We like to call this uh, a magnet alley because here are all the magnets that we have used. There's actually, uh, we have people that actually make magnets. This is a, for a while there, that's all they were doing with their time. Magnets over here, magnets on all of the doors. These are just these are just cartons of chalk. Um, we buy, yes, we buy chalk by the case. Here is the, uh, here's the George Soros Theater. I don't even remember what this was, but I, I remember saying early in the morning, we have to have one of those things where you could take the lungs out and the heart, and then I never got around to using it that day. So, so we have it in case I ever needed to do that show again. Of course, we have the chainsaw. You name it, we have it. I don't know what's going to happen to all of it. Um, I don't know, maybe we could sell it for charity or something. Anybody want cases of chalk? Let me take you here back um, to the set. As you see, we're starting. Here's the timeline I showed you yesterday. This is, uh, this is what we had on the timeline. This is actually, they're taking it all apart now. Um, because this is our last show. It has been an amazing ride. And I have worked with some amazing people. And I have made amazing friends, namely you. I want to show you a few things that I was thinking the other day about who we were just two and a half years ago, me and you as individuals, the things that we believed then and what is it that we believe now. I think if you would just think of the way the country was two years ago, you would realize as much as I do, we have changed a lot. There are things that we didn't even know two years ago, two and a half years ago, things we didn't think were important, um, and things we didn't believe that we do now. Things we've learned. This is just me, I don't know about you, but ask yourself this, two and a half years ago when this program first come, came on the air, did you even know what progressives really were? I mean, besides car insurance, what was that? Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I didn't know him until about a year or so ago. Ben Franklin, Andrew Jackson. That means cry, I think. Alexander Hamilton, the Black Founders. When we, when we brought Faith, Hope, and Charity and we did Founding Fridays and we did the stories of the founders and we did the African-American founders, did you even know any of this? I didn't. I didn't, and I've learned right along with you. And here's the best part about this. I really feel, and I always have, I like live television. I don't like to be taped, because I feel, I can almost feel you at times. I can feel a connection when it's live. I know when you're saying, yes! And history has played such a huge role. You and I have, um, done a lot together and we've learned a lot together and you've taught me a lot. I want to show you two pieces of something that just came in uh, to me today from a viewer. This is a report of the Committee on Fascism. This is an original copy of when Congress was trying to figure out Okay, this Mussolini thing, uh, Hitler, what, what are they doing exactly? What is it? I have viewers and listeners sending me things from all over the country because they know we can use it to teach people things. And also they know that we'll preserve it, telling history. We have, we have taught things and learned things together that we never knew. Things that have been erased, Things that other people, in the guilds, they didn't think were important. This is actually from 1930, uh, 1939. 
here in America. Hitler's Mein Kampf in the present war. This was something that was written um, to warn of the impending cataclysm of the world. People wouldn't pay attention. And so somebody put this together. Now part of this is um, uh, you know, the different parts of what's going on in Germany. But this I love because there was a rumor going around that, that Hitler was a Christian and so uh, that's going to be great. And this author took the document of the official guide for education of the Hitler youth and said, um, you know, there's 50 points that they're supposed to be teaching their children here in the Hitler youth and he's not a Christian. And here are some of them. Have you ever, ever heard this before? One, Hitler Youth being taught, Christianity is a religion for slaves and fools. Christianity and communism are identical. Christianity does not differentiate between white people and Negroes. Uh, the New Testament is a Jewish lie written by four evangelicals. There is no Christian culture. Christianity has spoiled the German people because it taught them ideas such as adultery and theft, which they had never known before. Christianity is only a substitute cover for Judaism and invented by Jews in Rome. Jesus was a Jew. How did Christ die? Whining on the cross. How did Planeta die? This is the, um, uh, the guy who murdered the chancellor. How did he die? Saying, Heil Hitler. That's what was being taught. And this was a warning in 1939 to the American people. Thank you for sending it. Think how many people you've just taught. We've learned a lot together, an awful lot. We learned about the Fabian window and Fabian socialism. Did you even really know about that? We learned about Margaret Sanger. I mean, I know what I learned in school, but that ain't what the truth is. Founder of Planned Parenthood wanted to kill African Americans through abortions. She celebrated today. The road to serfdom. Social justice, a phrase that is so dangerous because it can be used for good. But when you know the history behind social justice, you better investigate, especially because it's being used in churches. They've also hijacked the word even further to include environmental justice, and reproductive justice, and economic justice. We learned about the other NRA, the recovery program from FDR, and how they used bullying and intimidation. We showed the history of unions and their roots in communism. We showed you the coming insurrection two years ago. We said, hey, you know, that there's going to be problems in Greece. Nobody paid attention. Now look at it. We told you about the black flag anarchists. There's one story I have not told yet that I've been trying to get on. Tiffany, how long have I been trying to tell the story of the Statue of Liberty? I'd say for just about 29 months. That's about 29 months. There's a great story on the first real terrorist attack in America right around the turn of the century that will boggle your mind. I will get to it, just not tonight. <laughs> I'm out of time here. Um, but uh, you have to hear it. We learned about ACORN. You're informed on the caliphate. This information has allowed us to look at everything in a whole different way. It has allowed us to look and have some perspective. To believe that, yeah, things like things are, are possible. Things are indeed true that there are some people who want to harm the United States. It explains why we keep on piling debt. We showed you that this debt clock, only way out of this is real trouble now. And maybe it's hyperinflation, maybe. We showed you that that can happen. We asked you to prepare. We showed you the Great Depression of 1920. How many people even know that? And how it was turned around, and it can be done again if we learn from history. We showed you the Hindenburg Omen, the Kondrakiev Wave, the Overton Window. We showed you how there's something, tragedy and hope. The tragedy is war. And the hope, they said in the 1960s, was that we've tied the world's economy together. To have mutually assured destruction without a nuclear weapon, it would be done through debt and it would be done through collapsing economies. We showed you all of these things and how it tied together, how it feeds on one another. But I didn't do it as just an exercise. I always hated philosophy because... I love philosophy as long as it's not, 
Well, we only call a wheel a wheel because we call it a wheel. Oh, shut up. What difference does that make? We try to teach you things to help. Not you. I'm not doing it for, because I'm some great. I, I'm a dad, too. I want my country to be around. What we've been trying to tell you lately, in the last year, is that you are the answer. And that we must have faith, hope, and charity in our hearts. To paraphrase Martin Luther King, darkness cannot conquer darkness, only light can conquer darkness. Hate cannot conquer hate, only love can conquer hate. Talking about these things, faith, hope, charity, God, prayer. I'm talking about them, especially wrapped with a whole bunch of dead guys in wigs, isn't exactly popular, isn't exactly mainstream television, and none of it makes for rating success. But I contend that is the reason we are successful here. Because it's true. It seems as though there's no truth anymore. We've made an awful lot of enemies on this program. We've joked before, gosh, can we, is there, I mean, is there anybody else we can take on? I mean, we've taken on every single person we've been told not to take on, from the anarchist to the president to the Republicans to George Soros, because the truth has no agenda. It will lead us where it leads us. But this program has not only survived, we have thrived. We've done amazing things together, and I thank you for watching. And we've done it, I mean, we've done it with chalkboards. Is that bizarre? Look at the things that we have done that are so ridiculous. The chalkboard. Who would have thought this chalkboard would be, you know, CNN, come on, CNN is doing like holographic hookers and stuff. We're using a chalkboard. I always, I said last night, I feel like I always have chalk on my clothes. We are the, we're the show that had the red phone. I don't know of anybody who's ever looked anybody in the eye and said, oh, really, you're calling me a liar? Here's the phone number. Call me. And sent them the phone number. They never called. Of course, we're the only show where I've cried more than shows about babies. I mean, the babies crying. I think we've eaten more food on television than most shows on the Food Network. And we've also proved more than anything else that conservatives can read and they like to read. We've made books like the seven events that made America, the Federalist Papers, the real Thomas Jefferson, the wives of the signers, George Washington's sacred fire, the 5,000 year leap, the road to serfdom. Road to serfdom sold more when we talked about it in this program than it usually sells in a year. I mean, it was printed in what, 1946? And speaking of words, staggeringly long monologues. I'll never forget when I first went on uh, the other network. Um, I first got into this business five years ago. They told me, you can't talk for more than 45 seconds. You can't. You've got to change the screen. You've got to do something. You can't do that. I think we got up to six or seven minutes over that other network because they were just spooked. They were just like, no, people will just, they're dumb. One of the competitors on this show, if you want to call him that, is John Stewart, I guess. I just want to show you, give you some idea. When we first came here, on our very first show, I did a monologue that was seven and a half minutes long. I remember the first 18-minute monologue we did, and everybody freaked out. We now do typical 21-minute monologues to open the show. Our first monologue was 1,000 words. Today, they're 2,500 words. That's the first 21 minutes of this show. Give you some perspective. Jon Stewart does six minutes. Total time on air with guests is 22 minutes a night. Our average on uh, without guests, all monologue, all spoken word, 42 minutes. Jon Stewart, let me show you this. this is, here's Jon Stewart. <laughs> this is him at the... I don't know, Grammys or Emmys or whatever they give for television. I don't, I don't know, because I'll, I'll never win one. But um, here he is with his writers. Okay? He's got 15 writers for this segment. I, I, be I believe he's had as many as 40 writers. 
he uses these writers for six minutes of television and a total of 22 minutes a night. Whoa. Now I want to bring in my writers. Um, bring them in. Go ahead and bring them all in because we have never seen them. Can you bring them? Bring them in. Oh, here they are. It's Dan and Pat. Hi, Dan. Hi, Pat. That's it. That's all. It's easy to speak from the heart. It's easy to do things when you actually believe them. Uh, and we've done it with a remarkably small and dedicated staff and a remarkably large and dedicated audience. And we thank you for that. My whole world has changed because of the time we spend together every day at 5 o'clock. This is the last um, program. Uh, and I just want to show you little things that because we've met, um, things change. Holding money. If I wouldn't have said this two and a half years ago. I look at this one. It's Ben Franklin. The Benjamins. Abolitionist. I mean staunch abolitionist, was willing to go looking crazy, go to his grave looking crazy because of it. Um, Grant, one of the most corrupt presidents in all of history, not modern history. Um, Andrew Jackson, why is this guy even on our money? Indian killer, um, manifest destiny, horrible, horrible man. Um, Hamilton. Hamilton um, wanted the big banks, he wanted the monarchy, also the writer of the most of the Federalist Papers. Lincoln. You know that, I always thought Lincoln freed the slaves, and he did. You know who he credited as freeing the slaves? Oh boy, this is going to get me in trouble uh, with everybody, I think, but Michelle Bachman, the founders, that's who he said freed the slaves. And this guy, he's almost been a cartoon to me up until the last two years. You know, I did not tell a lie. Let's eat some cherry pie. The indispensable man and my hero. Man, it's been a wild ride. Um, and so many things have been said. Uh, you know, I'm the, I don't know if you know this, I'm the first anti-Semitic Jew lover. Did you know that? I don't even know how that's possible, but apparently it is. I'm the only host who is simultaneously the most dangerous person in America because of my influence and the least influential person in America because my ratings are supposedly declining, which I don't know how that one works either. Uh, and that one's not true either. Um, this program broke every single record in the 5 p.m. time slot. Every single record. It is the highest rated show in the history of cable news at this hour. We're always, always in the top five. And we are competing with the prime time time slots and we only have 40 percent of the households even watching tv that are watching after 8 p.m i read a story today in the paper and they wanted to know the real reason why i'm leaving mm, i don't know i'll give it to you here in a second oh it's all oh, the press is going to look stupid again anyone watching this show knows Anybody watching this show also knows that I have bent this format so far out of its structure and its parameters. I mean, this is a news channel. I do commentary. But I do more than that. I have a desire to do more than just commentary, and we have. This program launched the 912 movement. I asked you last year, I asked you, will you come to Washington, D.C.? And just don't bring a sign and help me restore honor. Hundreds of thousands of people showed up. I didn't even tell you what we were going to do. You just knew it. You believed in something bigger than me, bigger than you, bigger than all of us. And you came. Let me tell you something. Doing things like this would make the bravest of all networks wet their pants. I can't imagine. And this one stood by me. They, I didn't tell them what I was doing. I think they were probably pretty nervous. I told you at the beginning of this year that we were going to roll up our sleeves. I was going to roll up mine and get to work. 
I'm tired of waiting around. This summer is the beginning of that for me. I'm going to Israel in search of courage. What makes people live in Israel? Because it's a ticking time bomb and they know it. Where do they get that courage? How can I get some of that courage? What has made people stand up in the face of great evil as they have in the past? Because I believe great evil is here. What makes them that way? I don't know. I begin my search tonight after this broadcast. I'm no smarter than you. I may be able to figure out some things maybe a little faster than you, but I bet you're way ahead of me on other things. I mean, we're not that different. I, I bet that we look at the current crop of candidates and you're as tired as I am of waiting for George Washington or Ronald Reagan or anybody. I told you at the beginning of the year, first episode back this year. I'm tired of waiting around. I'm tired of waiting for somebody to leave. This show has become a movement. It's not a TV show. And that's why it doesn't belong on television anymore. It belongs in your home. It belongs in your neighborhoods. Not really television. One other first before we move on. Um, and this is the first that I think I'm probably um, most proud of. I started this program with a handshake with Roger Ailes. I ended it with a handshake about an hour ago. Well, and cake, too. I mean, you think I'm going anywhere without cake? There are people that say that I was fired on this program. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Here's your first. Look carefully at your screen. This is a national broadcast. I'm a wild, crazy man. Look at the screen. Do you notice that it says live at the corner? I believe this is the first time that anyone has decided to leave a network, or certainly one that has ever been fired, that had the word live in the corner of the last 42-minute live ad-libbed monologue. I hope I have earned some level of your trust. And at the same time, I want to thank Roger Ailes, Rupert Murdoch, and everybody at this network for their trust. How nice of you, Brett. Thank you very much. And Patty Ann came to the studio yesterday, and she was uh, so kind. She has always been kind to me. And Bill O'Reilly, unbelievable gentleman. He is, um, he's been great. Um, I've always told you this is a show, as we're breaking the set down here and restoring it to the way it was, which is weird. We're not transforming it. We're restoring it. Anyway, um, I told you this show was uh, a show. It is. Um, we believe in something, but we do a show. Um, we have to get the eyeballs. That's why we, you remember the, remember the show we did with the bunny, and the, <laughs> the bunny and the chainsaw? I will admit, many times I only do things like this to hack the left off. I will admit that. But we, in the time that we have been together, we've tried to give you the tools, and now is the time for action. And I'm not your leader, um, and you know that. Um, America is made of individuals, and when the individuals are strong, when the entrepreneur is strong, then we heal ourselves. That's the secret. It's you and me and people who disagree with us politically that made this country great. And it's, it's, it's the same with the show. It's not just me, it's you and it's the crew. This crew, I didn't know this. Um, I didn't know this happened in television. I mean, I just, sometimes I was just, I'm just the dumbest guy. Stop hiding back there, Oscar. Um, this crew taught me something, and so did the crew that I worked at the other network. And I've seen it. I mean, it's, it's really bad at some of these networks. I think all the crew is just dead inside at some of the big networks. Um, and it's because nobody ever asked them their opinion. Did I not say, who did I say first time? Jack, was it you that I said to the first time? Harry, I know you heard it. 
I said, um, what do you guys think of that? And one of these guys said, you talking to me? I said, yeah. It's insane. You would think, you come here every night, and you think, I have answers or I have creative ideas. But sometimes it comes from these guys. There was a time when I was going to get rid of the chalkboards. And I said, I don't know. I said, Maybe we need to do something high tech or something. And it was Oscar that said, no. I think it was something. And I kind of, I was like, okay, well, that's not good. I think Oscar said something like, his signature. I think you said, you are Mr. Chalkboard. You are a chalkboard. I'm like, I, what, I'm all dusty. And that is my signature. It was Oscar to thank for that. Was it, Oscar, you were the one who said also that we should talk to the black uh, community, the black conservatives, and find out what they were saying? It was his idea. We didn't just do one show. We did two shows. We followed up with it. It was a, it was an amazing, amazing uh, show. Jack, Jack, <laughs> Jack was the guy who said, you should have a juggler on. <laughs> oh, he did. I don't remember. Do you remember why we had the juggler on? Yeah. Um, we gave him, we gave him uh, balls with uh, like inflation and the economy. Oh, yeah. He was juggling all the balls of inflation and everything else. And um, his idea. I remember it was Jack and Oscar. It was, it was Jack mainly that came up to me after the uh, founding um, uh, fathers that were African American. And he was angry. Why didn't we know this? Why? There was one time that I was talking to a guest, David Horowitz, about racial profiling by law enforcement. And Jack said to me, that's wrong. We went into a break, right? Yeah. And we, Austin, I is he mic'd? Can people hear him? No, can't hear him. Okay. So he said, um, I'm sorry about that. I don't know why. Um, but he said, you got to go back and ask him something. And I said, I don't know. You, you, uh, is your, you, you ask him. And he looked at me and said, what? I said, come on, you ask him. So we put him on. Watch. Here's, here's Jack. When we went into the break, Jack and Oscar, and uh, Jack is a sound guy. Oscar is, uh, runs camera three here. They both said to me, he doesn't know what the hell he's even talking about. And, uh, and yeah. well, first of all, Jack, you tell me. Why, why does he have it wrong? He have it wrong for a simple reason. I borrowed my friend's truck. I was pulled over because of a brake light. I said, fine, just give me the ticket and I'll take care of it. Harry, who is behind camera too, you can barely see Harry here. Harry has been here. This guy, is, this guy is, he knows more about the Middle East than I do. And he's traveled all over the world. He asked me once during a break um, why deflation was a bad thing. As I started to explain it, I realized that would make a good segment. We changed the next segment of the show. It also bring in all kinds of uh, great examples of propaganda and books that we've used on this program. Did they make a difference? I think so. I think so. And that is the key, that it is not one person dictating down. When you work as a team, when you hire good people, we all have the ability to make the difference. We may not all stand in this light, but if it wasn't for the people behind me, never in the light, well, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't really have a good show. When we went on the air with um, this show, it was, um, is it over here? Here. This is, I said, here. This is only the third time that I'd ever done live television before. It was the day before President Obama's inauguration. This show is linked to this iconic event. We end up now, 29 months later, with the firm reliance on the individual, not the pomp and circumstance, none of that. Somebody said to me a while back, um, the best negotiating advice I have ever gotten, never negotiate, make promises, never threaten, make promises. Know what you believe and then just state it. I have to tell you, when, a lot of, uh, when I was um, saying that I was gonna leave, a lot of people thought I was negotiating. I think even my agent thought I was negotiating at first. He was like, well, that's going to be a good negotiation. I was like, no, no, that's it. They're done. You state, you make promises to people. My promise to you, it was my promise to you, 
that I would stay until the changing of the seasons. Any members of the press that want to know what really happened, I invite you now to go back to the transcripts of this program. No one in my audience is surprised that I'm leaving. Go to glennbeck.com and find out what's ahead for me. But quick stop. I left breadcrumbs everywhere. I knew what the media would say, and I want to make sure no one questioned it. Do we have the videotape from uh, South Dakota? Nope. Um, someplace we have it in a vault. I said about a year ago, maybe a little longer than a year ago, I was in South Dakota, and I tried to say it because I knew nobody from the mainstream press would be there. And I remember I walked off stage, and Joe said to me, Glenn, do you know what you just said? And I said, yes, I do. Yes, I do. What I said on stage was, um, I don't know what the next uh, few months brings to me. I will tell you this, that I, uh, I don't think it's going to be television. I said it for a reason, because I knew exactly what the press would say. Also on September 30th, I said this on this program. I talked to a trusted friend about six months ago, and he gave me, I think, some sage advice. He said... Well, where would, you, where would you run to? And I said, I don't, I don't know. He said, to everything there is a season. Continue. Continue for a season. Because you don't ever run from something. You run to something. But I sense, metaphorically, that the leaves are changing. The seasons are changing. I don't know if we're headed into winter or I hope, into spring. That conversation came with a trusted advisor because I said, I'm not supposed to be here anymore. I'm not supposed to be doing this. There's something else I'm supposed to be doing. And he said, well, you can't define it yet. And I said, no, I'm, very, I'm this close. He said, wait a season. You will know. I say these things now because I want you to know, I want the record to be clear. I also want you to know which media organizations you can trust and which one you can't. I also want to make this promise that they will not hear again because they didn't hear the message of 828. They won't hear the message of restoring courage in Israel. They won't hear, they won't hear this message now. But for those members of the media who are celebrating, I waited for a season. I know exactly where I'm going. And you will pray for the time when I was only on the air for one hour every day. Back in a second. I want to leave you with a couple of messages here tonight. Um, one of them is never ever give up. Never ever listen to the experts. They're usually wrong. Uh, believe in yourself. On this final show here at Fox, we've shown you the spin, the lies, the speculation on the media that, you know, why I'm leaving, where I'm going, whatever. Find out where I'm going at glennbeck.com right now. I am leaving because, as I said in my radio program this week, I have given up on admiring the problem. I have I've given up on the problem, in fact. I am focused solely on the solution. They're making their plans. What are you doing? I'm a dad, too. I am not going to wait around and wait for anybody in the media. Nothing's going to change unless you and I roll up our sleeves and we become part of the solution. And part of that is don't ever allow anyone else, even me and anybody, anyone, tell you what the truth is. Don't allow that. Don't take it as gospel because it's not gospel. You have to find out for yourself what is true. I didn't run away from something. <laughs> I'm running to something. I know exactly where I'm supposed to be. I was told um, uh, recently that nobody ever leaves this business. This guy did. He did. Jack Parr, he started The Tonight Show. He did. I don't know why. He might have been crazy, but then again... About four months ago... I had made the decision exactly what I was going to do, um, but it was hard. It was hard. This, all, this is sweet. There's never a bigger platform than the Fox News Channel. Never. There's never a smarter guy I'm going to work with than Roger Ailes. Never. And I, I live in an apartment here in New York City. I mean, I went apartment uh, hunting with my daughter the other day 
here in New York, I mean, it, they're closets. And, um, and usually rat-infested closets. I, I live in a nice apartment here in New York. And it was so surreal because I went home that night um, after I had seen Spider-Man like the 400th time. And, um, and Bono happened to be there. And I was sitting there with my wife at Spider-Man. And uh, understand, I am no different than you. I have never in my life been the cool kid, ever. Ever. I mean, it was cool to be the cool kid for about two minutes and um, get a text on my phone and I just laugh and I show it to my wife and we're on, so in the middle of watching the show and she laughs. And what it said was, Bono's backstage, would you like to meet him? I just looked at her and I went, this is ridiculous. We were just, this is ridiculous. So we went backstage and uh, afterwards uh, we went home and we were standing in our apartment and I had just a just a second where I'm like well now wait a minute how do you leave all of this at this point I was overlooking the skyline of New York now again I'm a guy who um, you know I grew up in a small town in Washington I'm the son of a baker in my high school yearbook I wrote in New York City I think I even wrote Rockefeller Plaza in my yearbook because it was my goal now here I am in New York Bono, we're hanging out, be money, and me, yeah, right. Um, and I said to my wife, how could we possibly, how could we leave all of this? How could we do it? Here I am at the pinnacle. There's nowhere else to go from here. How could this be divinely inspired that we leave? We have access. We're throwing this huge platform away. Well, then I got the message of my life. I'll share that with you next. I just said to the staff, this is when it gets hard not to steal a memento from this, uh, from this set. We have so many great things. Honor. That stinks on ice. So I was telling you a story. Here we are, pinnacle of your career, and I'm looking over the skyline. Bono is not on the phone, but I'm pretending that he is. And... Um, I'm overwhelmed with a feeling. This is, I'm standing in my living room all by myself. My wife has gone to bed and like, okay, okay, freak boy. And I'm standing there and I'm looking at this city and I am overwhelmed with a feeling. If you don't leave now, you will not leave with your soul. As a guy who has traded my soul before, I will not trade it again. Never want anything too much, never it will destroy you. It all comes down to this. I learned the hard way who I was. We as a country now have a chance to learn who we are, what we're capable of, what we really truly believe before we're forced to learn it the hard way. Now is the time to be part of the solution. Now is the time to stand up. Now is the time to explore before it gets bad. Now is the time to prepare so you can be help for others. That's where I'm headed being part of the solution, and I want you to join me. Tonight, I am going to announce another big piece of what I am doing. It is called Mercury One. I am determined to my last breath to fix this country, one person, one family, one child, one entrepreneur, one town at a time. We will preserve man's freedom, one state, one country, one planet at a time. Look for that announcement in the next hour. Go now to glenbeck.com. My final thought, next. I just said to the guys, uh, the, I, this was on my set. Uh, I bought this a few years ago. This was on my set at the other network. In the end, you only walk out with what you came with. I mean, not in the end, the end. You know, I, anyway, I want to leave you with something that I, um, I think is another first. Maybe, maybe it's not. Uh, first of all, Sharky, can you bring the blinds up? We'll leave it the way we found it. Um, it is not the person that is leading the parade. 
It is not the person on the stage that gets all the credit. It is all the people behind them. It's all the people that have made this possible from the very beginning. They don't usually run credits. We wrote them on a chalkboard. I thought that was appropriate. From New York. Good night, America.